from halfway across the bridge to Terabithia. It's the IGN Digigod. Digigod. So take off your thinking caps and please welcome two prisoners of Second Avenue, Wade Major and Mark Kaiser. <laughs> Yeah, that was a little vintage opening from 2008. 2008, ancient history to us. You know what? The older you get, the more you realize that it, it, we're dead. Yeah. Let's just die now. I mean, Mine's honestly, th- you know what? Like, you, you know, 12 months used to take 12 months. Actually, you know yeah. what? When you were younger, 12 months used to take about 18 months. Yeah. Now 12 months takes about 12 weeks. It, it really does. It's 2012 tomorrow. Yeah. And in about 10 minutes, it'll be 2013. Just the time goes so fast. Jeez. It's depressing. <laughs> All right. Good night, folks. Good night, everyone. <laughs> Drive safely. Anyway, yeah, we're going we're gonna to run a, a few little vintage openings uh, for while we get the new openings all in order. But uh, thank you to everybody who has sent them in. Please continue to send them in. We're still uh, going through everything. So if you've got any good ideas for new openings, go ahead and email them to us at gods at digigods.com. And don't forget to email us your audio questions. Yeah, we, we actually have uh, have uh, a couple that we're going to run this week from uh, Lance Taylor. Yes, because Lance listener. Taylor, yeah. uh, he actually, uh, he he answered the call to provide some audio questions. He sure did. God. How, how hard could it be it, in 2011? You uh, you load up the thing, you record it, you email it at gods at digigods.com. That's it, gods at digigods.com. Jesus Christ. And uh, we, you know, yes. we, we, had a, we had a contest last week for that uh, Craig Ferguson DVD. We you know did? That. We did. Yes, we did. Uh, we who sure won did. the contest? Contest was won by two people. Cliff Kennard of uh, Pine Mountain Valley in Georgia. That's great, right? Pine Mountain Valley. I don't I even know where that. I don't even know where It just is. sounds so bucolic and, yeah. uh, and woodsy. And then uh, California's own Edmund Mendez. So uh, congratulations to the two of them. We will be uh, sending your information on to the the distribution company and the publicist, and uh, they'll be taking care of you. And if they don't, let us know. We'll go rough them up. That's what we'll do. We'll uh, Wade, made, Wade made that promise, not me. Yeah, we'll go, we'll go rough him up. Uh, so, uh, Mark, the, uh, we're starting to get the first, and we'll talk about this uh, you know, in the coming weeks, obviously, but we're starting to get the first ultraviolet releases in tandem with Blu-rays and DVDs. Isn't that interesting? Uh, not to me. No, me neither. Okay, good night, everyone. Yeah, but, <laughs> but you know, Ultraviolet, for those who don't know, Ultraviolet is a new video standard that has been uh, at great length and at great expense been developed in the uh, league between, you know, uh, tech companies and uh, studios and distributors, and they're all trying to develop what is a basically a digital locker standard, and this is uh, all about movie portability. So you wind up purchasing the movie, but you don't actually... Except unless it comes in tandem with a Blu-ray, you don't own a physical copy of the movie. You sort of own the right to see that movie in perpetuity. And it exists somewhere out in the ether in the cloud. And it sits there in your digital locker. And you know what? I, 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 whatever I, video I, device you have, whether it's your phone or your iPad or you know whatever, you can just sort of uh, key in. And somewhere, you know, the, the gods on high will <laughs> shoot this movie down for your access and your pleasure and your enjoyment. I'm not sure it's going to take off. I, I just want to know the, 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 the why, like maybe like Disney's you know, yeah. Nine Old Men or the Three Wise Men. Yeah. Who sat down and said, okay, we need... Okay, basically what we have is a, 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 is a gigantic King Kong server farm for all your stuff. <laughs> now, King Kong server farm, it, it, it's not sexy. People, we, it, it takes too much explaining. What should we call it? How about, how about the garage? How about your digital trough? No, 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 that doesn't work. I don't get that. How about your digital cloud? <laughs> yeah, or a locker. Kids know, kids know what lockers are. It all makes sense. It's a locker. Ultraviolet. You, you, you put a visual on it. It's Where a digital did ultraviolet locker. come from? I don't Who knows? You know, the, here's the thing with the cloud. I, I have to tell you, honestly, you know, as you know, I'm starting to replace all of my most beloved DVDs with Blu-rays. Uh, a lot of films that I have that aren't my favorites or they're fine. I'm not running to, re, uh, to replace on Blu-ray. But um, I find that. Until there's lossless audio, and until I get all the extras, and until I get the yep. full blown high def picture, I'm I'm just going to own Blu-rays. I mean, that's it. Yeah, no, I I, I, I I love streaming. I love it. But in terms of like owning stuff, 
the two other stories that we should talk about this week before we actually get to talking about the this stuff. And we're not actually going to be talking about uh, ice cream or cooking as we've been detouring into lately. But I stopped cooking, by the way. Can I tell you why? Why? Put, put, put that thought on hold. Whatever you're about to say. Yes. Okay. Tell, I'll finish later. But why have you stopped cooking? Because I'm getting too fat. <laughs> well, I don't fit my pants. Here's the thing. I, okay, can I say can I say something? I'm I'm, I'm about 163 pounds, right? <laughs> you're lighter than I am. I'm about 163 pounds. Uh, well, because you're all muscle. I'm well, fat. Oh yes, I'm. You're big, you're, yes, uh, I'm, I'm. I'm a. I'm, I'm a gigantic. Uh, you know, <laughs> cream uh, puff. I'm a big, big cream puff. <laughs> I'm a jelly belly. Okay. My my love handles go from like my neck to my knees. That's You're, where my love handles but go. You used to be so much heavier. You used to be heavier than I was. I was almost two hundred pounds until you had that like parasite that that consumed half of your body weight, and then you were no. I, I was almost two hundred pounds, and I have and I have video of me being two hundred pounds on network television. Very embarrassing. <laughs> I was one hundred ninety nine pounds when I appeared on NBC late night and uh, in, in, in a skit. And I said, and I said, no this way. is humiliating. I became one eighty. I became one seventy five. Then I got an intestinal virus, where I couldn't eat anything for a week, so I had no choice but to shed ten pounds and became one sixty five. After which I thought, hmm, I like being one sixty five. I'm going to stay here. Anyway, so I was down to about one sixty two, one sixty three, which is a good weight. Yeah. Then I started cooking for myself. Now you think to yourself. People love cooking because then you learn how to you, – you cook well. You know what's going into all of your food. You know there's no preservatives. Not when I cook. When I cook, I cook just the most fattening crap you can possibly want. I'm cooking chili and cookies, and I'm cooking brownies. So, and you, you, you emailed me the recipe for the mac and cheese at Cut, which is a very famous uh, steakhouse in yes. Los Angeles. And literally, it's got – that thing's got – and I haven't made it yet because I can't. That thing's got three cheeses, yes. creme fraiche, yeah. plenty of pasta, yeah. God knows what else. You probably so, you, you probably just have to you just have to buy a cow. So you're and put the cow me. into the pot. <laughs> you're telling me. So that parasite actually did you a, a world of good. Yes. So anyway, so I started cooking for have myself. You, have you kept in touch with, with the cow? With the parasite. We're dating. Good. I met him on uh, Match.com. Yeah. Good. <laughs> um, anyway, so I'm making all this fattening crap, and I and I, I realize I'm getting heavier. And I woke up, I was 168, which is not heavy. I'm not saying I'm fat, or whatever. But I'm saying, okay, hang on for a second. I was 162, 163. Now I'm 168 because I keep cooking for myself. Just stop it. So I, I'm I'm taking this week off from cooking. Got it. So what were you saying? I, nothing even remotely that important. <laughs> uh, no, I was going to point out that also in the world of streaming and so forth, another interesting thing has happened this week, which is the uh, the Kindle Fire was announced. Now the Kindle Fire is, as I understand it, a basic. It's a new Kindle, color kin, uh, Kindle, touchscreen, the whole deal, Android powered. Correct. That is correct. Android operating system, and uh, with it, you uh, you get uh, an initial free month or two f- uh, subscription to and uh, to Amazon Prime, which entitles you to you know like ten thousand streaming titles or something like that, as well as you know free shipping on certain Amazon items and so forth. So um, now Amazon Prime has half the number of streaming titles as you get with uh, Netflix, which is up to like twenty thousand or something. But still, not a bad deal. It's um, a little bit less expensive. Not much. It's like seventy sixty nine dollars a year, but uh, you know. I'll that, tell you the, uh, the 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 Amazon. Amazon that's very that, interesting. Yeah. And you know what? Because they have what Apple has, which is that they have a built in storefront. Absolutely. They've got Amazon dot com. Apple yeah. has Apple dot com. You know, the, you know, Playbook or all these other ones that yeah. are falling by the wayside. They didn't have that. Nope. And the, the, and somehow, even though they're taking about a six seven dollar loss on every fire that they sell. The thing's only $199. They got that thing under that $200 price point. That's amazing. Yeah, that's impressive. Now, of course, it's, you know, it's... You know, it's, it, got half the, it's got half the, the uh, storage uh, of the, uh, the iPad, and once the iPad 3 comes out, it'll have significantly less. So, I mean, the, the, the big mom of the 800-pound gorilla is still the iPad. However, another interesting new statistic is that uh, fewer people are downloading movies and music from the iTunes store. And more are downloading apps, so they're a little bit panicking because media is not as strong as it was. We'll see. You know, I mean, it's they're within percentage points of being, you know, probably influenced by how bad movies and television are. But that well, being said. The, well, the, the thing too is that um, you know the whole Apple TV concept has never taken off. Apple selling individual, no. it's, it's not really gaining much traction. Another story that we should talk about before we get around to DVDs and Blu-rays um, is that Disney is reportedly remastering Song of the South in 4K. 
You know, I had read something on a comment uh, on a, uh, a web page and a comment board underneath it that I thought was very interesting, and yes. I um, I had emailed it to you, and uh, we haven't corroborated this. Mm-hmm. It's really all I'm getting it from is this one mention on this one site, but uh, I think that'd be fantastic. You know, we all understand what Song of the South is, just like the birth of a nation, blah blah blah. But it's still a piece of movie history that needs to be. It needs to be out there. Yes, especially especially when no less than. Tracy Morgan has actually spoofed it on Saturday Night Live. If you ever saw his uh, his uh, uncle, is it with Uncle Remus uncle. Mash, li- mash Liquor <laughs> thing? Have you ever seen that one? No. Oh, it's hysterical. It's like Aunt Jemima's husband. Uh, instead, of she does while well, she does the syrup, he does mash liquor, and it's actually very funny. He plays both parts, and they got the little animated birds and the whole thing. It's really funny, but it's only funny to a certain generation that understands the frame of reference. That is and, very true. You know, come on. Seriously, and look, you, you you go to Disneyland, you go on to Thunder Mountain, you still have like Briar Rabbit, and you got all the characters from the damn film on the ride. The movie that they were they're taken from isn't even out there. Come on, contextualize it. Fine, you know Warner Brothers is 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 facing a bit of the same struggle with some of their World War II animated shorts that uh, you know obviously portrayed the Japanese in an unflattering light. They're trying to sort of contextualize that as well because that's not politically incorrect, and there's a lot of stuff and. Everybody's animation archives uh, that it has some racial elements that they're not comfortable with. So everybody's dealing with this on some level. But just fine. Contextualize it. Get it out there. Give us a commentary. Put a disclaimer on it. You know, smoking is hazardous to your health. Get on with it. I agree. Could not agree yeah. more. All right. Shall we talk about movies? Oh, we're a DVD podcast. Well, you know what? Yeah, you know what? I thought Here, we were cooking. Podcast. Do this, do this baseball thing because it's baseball season, and you were going on it a bit before the show about the greatest day in baseball history. And yeah, I know, which I missed all of it. Oh my god, I just, you know what? I, I, I you know, I got a call from a friend of mine who said, "Let's go see our friend uh, play at the Silver Lake Lounge, which is a popular little funky lounge in Silver Lake in Los Angeles." And I'm like, man, it's it's day 162 of the season, and there's two. There's actually three, but there's two major wild card, uh, you know, races to be decided. And you know, I, I said, watched a bunch of the game at work, the two games at work. And I'm like, all right, look, the Yankees are up seven nothing, Boston's up three two. The Yankees are going to win, obviously. Boston, that game will go back and forth, but in the end, I think Boston will put it back together and win. All right, I'll go to the Silver Lake Lounge. So when I walked into the Silver Lake Lounge, Yankees were up by seven, Boston up by one. When I walked out of the Silver Lake Lounge, let's just say that the Yankees coughed up a seven-run lead, and Boston had lost and completed the biggest collapse in baseball history, and it all happened in the span of like four minutes. Both those games ended within like four minutes. It was just bizarre. Awesome. Now, um, what we have... Because they didn't make the playoffs, although they were kind of – they were not, not in it. They were in it is the California Angels. In Major League Baseball, every once in a while, they come out with these World Series collector's editions, which I love because um, I have the Mets 86 version. But this is the Angels uh, 2002. By the way, still the Anaheim Angels, ladies and gentlemen. Uh-huh. Not the Los Angeles uh, Angels of Anaheim. Right. Please stop that. Uh, this contains um, – uh, let's see. Lots of DVDs. Like – at least 26 of them. Yeah, it's, it's, let, let's put it this way, folks. We did not watch every single second of this set. <laughs> <laughs> this, this but you know what? But they were, you know what? They, they were a good team. You know, they, 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 they won 99 games that year, and, you know, they, they beat the Yankees, and they, they, they beat the Twins, and then, you know, they outslugged the, the, uh, the Giants. You know, Barry Bonds had a horrible World Series. He finally makes the World Series as a Giant, and he just almost completely shanks it. So there's definitely some drama. And uh, I'll be honest, uh, Wade, the Rally yes. Monkey, yeah, funny. I it, like it. You know, it was, uh, the Rally Monkey. Come on, pretty, I, I, the yeah, Rally Monkey is totally. funny. Give me a break, of course. So if you're an if you're an Angels fan, you must get Anaheim Angels 2002 World Series Collectors Edition set, all seven games. Um, good stuff. Although it's missing some of the extra extra features that some of the other World Series sets have. That's a bit of a bummer. There is a special DVD. Um, where you can watch the uh, television broadcast and yep. listen to the Angels radio network announcers, too. But, you know, I'm a little bummed about the lack of uh, super extras. Also, there, there, there's a very uh, – there's a one-disc collection, if you can call one disc a collection, called Angels Memories, the Greatest Moments in Angels Baseball History. And this it's is – a collection of memories. It's a collection of baseball memories. You know, it's Nolan Ryan and Frank Tanana and Mike, and Mike Witt and Don Sutton, you know, the, John Lackey, you know – 
the, a lot of great players came through the Angels. You know, Rod Carew, Reggie Jackson played for the yep. Angels later in his career. Yep. Garrett Anderson, you know, was a yep. great uh, Angels lead leadoff hitter. Anyway, good stuff. Um, Angels memories, uh, the greatest moments in Angels baseball history. Uh, we got a box set here, starting to get the big box sets. These are, uh, you know, getting in time for the holidays and other things. Uh, this is Friday the 13th, the Ultimate Collection, limited edition. This is the one they sent us was number 2,328 of 50,000. They number them, you see, so that you know how special you are. Just one of 50,000. You know, 50,000 does not seem that limited to me. <laughs> it really not. doesn't. Like 2,000, that's limited. Like I bought Matthew Modine's yeah. uh, Stanley, uh, Full Metal Jacket Diary. Yeah. I think that's 20000 I snagged one of those. There you go. Well, this is all eight deluxe, d- deluxe, I'm contracting words, all eight deluxe edition DVDs along with um, a, uh, a little mini Jason hockey mask that comes in the, in the package. Awesome. You know, this is the thing. They gotta, they, to do these deluxe sets, they got to put some little piece of swag in there, whether it's a little you know, miniature car or Godzilla. I have my Big Lebowski bowling ball Your swag. Your Big Lebowski bowling ball. So they put a little piece of swag in there to make you feel like it's worth the price. The thing that I find interesting, and this also does have a couple of uh, 3D glasses for the, uh, the one Friday the 13th that was shot in 3D. Um, th- there's nothing on here that hasn't already been released. All the deluxe editions are exactly the same. The hockey mask, obviously, uh, is new. But here's the problem. It's not Blu-ray. It's not Blu-ray. It's not Blu-ray. They have not, uh, apparently, as I understand it, and this is through the grapevine, they have apparently not completed uh, converting all the Friday the 13th films to sufficient resolution to release on Blu-ray. So they're just uh, throwing together basically a repackage in time for Halloween because you got to scrape up as much dough as you can at Halloween, and this is just kind of a new way of trying to get people to double or triple dip or whatever the case might be. So anyway, um, you know what? I don't like these films particularly, but... Um, some people do, so... I don't like them either. I really don't. And you know what? The one I almost would have seen was uh, Friday the 13th. I think it was 10, where they go into outer space. Remember yeah. Friday, the yeah. Freddy X, whatever they yeah, called it? Yeah. I mean, uh, I, I would have seen that. You know why? Because obviously it's ridiculous. That's the whole point, is that uh, it's just completely ridiculous. So I thought maybe they would just run with that. They And Not apparently really. it was very campy. Uh, I didn't see it. I, 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 I didn't wind up seeing it either, but yeah. uh, still, you know... Uh, now, Wade, here's the thing. There's a director, Wade. I know. His name is Alfred Hitchcock. Fat dude, right? He's a fat dude from, uh, he, he had a bunch, he, he had a good run in, uh, in his native, uh, England, and then he came to the United States. Um, there is a terrific five movie collection from, uh, the good folks at, uh, TCM, which of course star, uh, uh stands for, a, a tactile cuddly monkey. I don't know if you know that. Tactile Cuddly Monkey. Yes, that's TCM. Wow. Unbelievable. I had no idea. Now, all these are available uh, on their separate uh, DVDs, but if you want them packaged into one uh, DVD collection, Slimline, you should get the uh, Alfred Hitchcock Limited Edition, The Essential Collection. Now, Wade and I uh, always uh, complain about these Essential Collections because um, there's always like one great film and then like three ringers. Oh, no. Rear Window, Vertigo. North by Northwest, Psycho, and The Birds. All Hitchcock classics. But not Blu-rays. But not Blu-rays. Yeah, it's, the, it's that same problem. There's some bonus features. There's some documentaries. And uh, there's a commentary on Vertigo and North by Northwest. Uh, the films, each one of these films is great. I mean, there is no, I mean, it's unbe- literally, it's unbelievable. There's no ringer in the bunch. These are all classics. Usually, again, there's a great film, and then the bunch is junk. Uh, this is just terrific. I personally... You know, I covet my Blu-ray of North by Northwest, and I'm yeah. looking forward to the rest of them coming out on uh, Blu-ray. So, but if you know, maybe you don't have a Blu-ray, and but North by Northwest is and, not uh, is not part of the Universal TCM thing. Interesting. Yes, it's a uh, and yet at the same time boring. Yes, North by Northwest is a Warner Brothers release. Interesting. Yes. Uh, so that's great. But you know what? The Birds, Psycho, Vertigo, Rear Window. It's it, Honestly, it's great stuff. If, if you love Hitchcock and you have limited shelf space, I guess that's, that's what I can say. If you love Hitchcock and you have limited shelf space. Yes. You know, um, the um, we're getting a, a lot of the Miramax stuff coming out now through Lionsgate, the A-list stuff. Remember, Echo Bridge is releasing all the Blu-ray stuff and re-releasing the DVD stuff from, you know, that they kind of feel they need to have out there, but not the super A-list stuff. Although there's some really good stuff from Echo Bridge, as we've noted, but the really, really coveted jewels of the, you know, the crown jewels from the uh, Miramax library, those are getting the Lionsgate releases. And boy, we got a bunch of big ones this week, Mark. Some big ones. Really? 
Oh, yes. I don't know what they are. But first, before I get to those, I'm going to talk about one of the crown jewels from the Dimension Library that the Weinsteins took with them, that they didn't leave with Miramax. And, you know, I'm sure Miramax is kicking themselves for not hanging on to Scream 4. Um, yeah, uh, but you know what? We, we talked about 2 and 3 last yeah. week. Scream 4, this movie is, is not bad. It's, 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 I mean, it, it's tired and really needs to go away, but the yeah. movie was not bad. I just think that it didn't do as well as they had hoped. They, they, the, the, thing with, the thing with the Weinstein Company, I have to say, just yeah. to go a little off topic, the Weinstein Company, they're so on the bubble that every movie they release – becomes a referendum on if the company's going to make it. True. You know? It, and and you know, it was Inglorious Bastards, which did very, very well. Yeah. And uh, last year was, or earlier this year, it was Scream 4. And you well, know what? Uh, the film's fine. I, I kind of liked it, but it didn't do all that well. The thing is, of course, Scream 4 is, was last year. It, was just, it's, it came years and years and years and years after the last Scream. So, you know, it's, it, basically when the Weinsteins left uh, Miramax and went and formed the Weinstein Company, they took the rights to all of the Dimension stuff with them, which included this, this Scream series, and that's why we came out with Scream 4, because they're trying to resurrect the franchise. I don't know if it necessarily will. Um, Wes Craven uh, directed it, and you know they introduced a few new figures to it. Um, Nev Campbell comes back, and uh, Courtney Cox is back, and Emma Roberts, and David Arquette is back, and then Emma Roberts kind of joins in, and which is weird, because I think she's a better actress than that. Hayden Panettiere is in it. You know, so I, they're kind of trying to do a scream for the old generation and the new generation. I don't know that it worked, um, but anyway, there it is. You know, also in time for Halloween, that crazy Halloween. But here, here, folks, this is what we've got from the classic Miramax Library this week. I'm going to go right through these five films. You tell me, Mark. How does this sound? How does this hit you? Life is Beautiful, The Cider House Rules, Cinema Paradiso, Pulp Fiction, and Jackie Brown. All right, here we go. You ready? Here we go. Yeah. I'll tell you right now. Uh, Life is Beautiful, Annoying, would never watch it again. Uh, love it. Uh, Cider House Rules, uh, you know, it was fine, whatever, mawkish, whatever. Yeah, it's pretty good. Cinema Paradiso, uh, started out great, got worse as it went along. Amazing, impeccable, fabulous film. <laughs> <laughs> Pulp Fiction classic, uh, la, you know, less classic now than it was at the time. I like Jackie Brown. I do. It, I do. It's t- good. I do too. You know, the best thing about Jackie Brown. Let's just say the best thing about Jackie Brown is it is it is it it starts with a great song across 110th Street, reference to another great black exploitation film, kind of with with sort of an homage to The Graduate, just kind of tracking shot, moving along with her. And then we have the full opening credit sequence like you used to have until about the kind of mid to late 70s when suddenly credits were at the ends of movies, telling you the art director and all that stuff. And it ends with the little copyright, the little microscopic copyright yes. uh, pr- print at the very bottom of the screen where it's, you know, copyright. It, like, it went to every extra detailed effort to be one of those black exploitation films from the 70s. It was great. It was I thoroughly great. appreciated it. Yep. Terrific. So anyway, here's uh, here's what you get. You get three hours of bonus features on Jackie Brown, three whopping, and it's a good Blu-ray. It is a really good looking Blu-ray. Uh, Tarantino has given the his signature approval, his director approval to both of these releases, and um, you know this is when it pays to be an A-list director. They they know that you have a following. They want your blessing. So he oversaw it, and both are terrific, absolutely fantastic transfers. Uh, lots of featurette stuff here. Nice retrospective interviews with everybody involved. Tarantino, Pam Greer, Robert Forster, uh, everybody right on down. I'd, I'd even forgotten Robert De Niro was involved in this. That's so weird, isn't it? Elmore Leonard, who, of course, wrote the book. Um, in, more interviews. Uh, there's even the Siskel and Ebert at the movies where they reviewed Jackie Brown, which is uh, kind of priceless. I'd forgotten you know, how fun those old shows were. And uh, it's terrific. You know, uh, Can't just... Can't say a bad thing about it. Now, Pulp Fiction comes with a cool little uh, sleeve, and this has six hours of bonus content, all the same kind of stuff, including more Siskel and Ebert, the Tarantino Generation special that they did, uh, footage from various awards shows and festivals, including Cannes, which is great because I was there that year, by the way. Now, this has been out before. That's not. This is nothing that has not been on previous releases. Um, but I'll tell you, this was so controversial that year at Cannes. This is not the film people expected to win. Uh, Eastwood was president of the jury, and Catherine Deneuve was, like, vice president of the jury. Never happened before that there's a vice president. And um, 
everybody was talking about uh, Kieslowski's red as the winner because, you know, he had won Venice with white and he'd won Berlin with blue. And it's like, oh, it's the Triple Crown. No one's ever done it before. His trilogy, it's going to sweep all three major European festivals. And then suddenly, like, his film got nothing and Pulp Fiction got the, the, the win. And as Tarantino went up to accept his Palme d'Or, some lady is, like, screaming obscenities from the balcony. It was brilliant. Well, do you think Eastwood... Yes. Would give an award to, to Kieslowski? No. That's the thing, you know, yes. and and uh, even though it's a jury, you know, you have to have consensus. There's a lot of power in being jury president. You can literally hold a film or an award hostage and barter for everything else. You could say, you know what, you guys can give the rest of the awards whatever you want, but I'm insisting that we give uh, Pulp Fiction the top prize. And apparently it was a very divided festival, a very divided jury that year. Uh, Cinema Paradiso, one uh, foreign language film, Giuseppe Tornatore's uh, film that Mark thinks uh, is, does, isn't as good as it gets along. Um, you, you know, this is, I, I'm going to say, if you have the special, the ultra special uh, edition that was previously released that has, I think, both versions on it, the longer European version and the American version, um, that might be the thing to hang on to because this is just pretty much the movie as it was released in the U.S. along with a trailer. Uh, so I think a bigger special edition of Cinema Paradiso on Blu-ray is coming down the pike. It's fine. It's good. Worth upgrading to if that's what you want, but I think uh, some of you may want to hold off. Uh, Cider House Rules, you know, perfectly fine. Uh, a few special features thrown on here, including the previously released uh, commentary with the uh, director Lasse Hallstrom, John Irving, the novelist, and uh, producer Richard Gladstein. And then a featurette, so it's you know that's a that's kind of a, a spit it out, and then uh, life is beautiful uh, is somewhat the same as uh, Cinema Paradiso. Uh, you get a featurette and some commercials, and you know that's sort of it. But I still love. Do you really not fully just adore this movie? Uh, you know what? I I hadn't watched it in years, and you know it, it is well done, but uh, I mean I, he's oh, he's he, old, he annoys me. Well, he he's outworn his welcome a little bit. So. Well, what's funny because he followed that up with uh, Pinocchio. Pinocchio, which oh, is just gosh. the worst. What kind of who, what would make him think that he can play Pinocchio? He, you know what? He must that have grown crazy. up with he must have grown up loving that that story. I don't know. Or loving himself. He probably, you know, what he probably got, had this Oscar-winning success, and he traded that in. He traded all that good. He traded that credit in all that good cachet to do his dream project, Pinocchio. And his dream. Was a nightmare. Yeah, Coppola's dream project was Pinocchio too. At one point, jeez, man, whatever. Crazy people. Uh, yes, Wade. Yes. Am I talking about this? Or are you talking about that? Uh, you know what? Cover that. Oh, I will cover this. Uh, Transformers: Dark of the Moon is, um, yeah. you know, it's better than the second one, which is to say that uh, a, a drinking pee is better than eating feces. <laughs> I guess is what that's kind of like saying. <laughs> You know, I just, you know what? Here's the wait thing minute, is that, wait. what? I need, uh, hang I, Yes. Don't okay. make me repeat it because, you know. No, gonna, I'm not going to repeat it. I just need to, uh, I was going to say I need to digest that, but given the way that you phrased it, I don't want to quite use that phrasing. So I'm just, yes. it's okay. I'm over it. Carry on. You know, uh, look, Michael Bay is great with spectacle and the CG stuff. Some of it was absolutely uh, amazing and mm. there was some great action moments but the movie is just, uh, it's a Michael Bay film. What are you going to say? It's loud and it's obnoxious and it's like being eye raped, as one, uh, as one critic famously wrote uh, about the second one. And uh, I, you know what? I just don't want to be bludgeoned with a baseball bat for two and a half hours. I just don't. I, you know what? There's no story. There's, uh, the thing with the, with the Transformers, I, I never, they, I, I don't know why this is popular, honestly. I find these robots to be over-designed and confusing-looking, and I never know where their eyes are. And they, like every appendage, seems to be made out of like 500 billion tons of scrap metal that I can't <laughs> tell what where the fingers are. And either I, I don't. And, and, uh, Things are spinning and gyroscopes I, are moving. It really and, is yeah, true. I know. It really is true. I mean, I can't imagine these guys like sitting down for like high tea. It would take forever. <laughs> Get a transformer sit in that little chair. You know, how is he going to pick up that little teapot? When it's like his f each finger is like as big as my big as my car. Each yeah. finger is as big as my car. Yeah, actually, yeah. probably bigger. Probably bigger. Anyway, so uh, but does it look great? Your darn tuna looks great. It looks absolutely fantastic. Now the uh, the the it's a Blu-ray, obviously, and there's also a um, gigantic gobs of special features. There's on a thing. digital copy, and there's of course a regular Blu-ray, and uh, you know there's a bunch of special features which I don't want to see because it's all about how. Uh, they made the monsters and, or the How robots. How they make them and, uh, big and they can't sit down for high tea. Exactly. Yeah, no, I, hear you. <laughs> I don't know why I said over. that. Why did I say that? I have no idea. 
<laughs> it was good. It was spontaneous. Thank it was you. genuine. Spontaneous was non-comedy. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, so Peter Jackson, before he was a guy who uh, won Academy Awards, was a guy who made cheesy little horror films, or in the case of some of them, kind of cult horror films. Uh, almost more like a Sam Raimi type guy before, you know, back when Sam Raimi was... I mean, they're funny, both of those guys. They like they now direct big blockbustery movies, and yet they started making schlocky little horror films. Yeah, well, with, uh, with, with Peter Jackson, you were hoping that with Lovely Bones, he'd go back to that. He, he'd go back to that I sensibility, know. but he's just not that guy. Is he corpulent again? Did he put all that weight back on? Does he look like a hobbit again? Did he? I, I, I'd heard. I heard that working on the hobbit, he just somehow... Maybe it's like empathy pains or something anyway here's the thing taking uh taking off weight yeah when people take off weight what they don't realize is the taking off of the weight is not difficult yeah what's difficult is the keeping it off yeah that's once you true. take it off once you're jonah hill or once you're peter jackson you take off Kirstie all the weight alley. kirsty alley it's not taking it off it's no. keeping it off it's keeping it off well, here's the thing about Peter Jackson. You know, he he had a really weird career at the beginning with, like, Bad Taste and Meet the Feebles. And his third film as a director was Dead Alive. Now, this is two years. This is 1992. This is two years before he made Heavenly Creatures and legitimized himself. Heavenly Creatures is the film that just suddenly said, wow, this is a guy to pay attention to. And then he went and he made The Frighteners, and he had to redeem himself again by doing the Lord of the Rings films. Very strange. Anyway, uh, Dead Alive is, uh, you know, I don't know that it's all that scary but it certainly is gory and uh it has been called you know the the most horrifying of all horror films and you know all kinds of uh, outrageous hyperbolic declarations it, frankly it's it's kind of a, a classic australian horror film if you kind of know what that means and the idea is that there is this it, it kind of gets into that uh, that son mother dynamic that so many uh, horror films have uh, embraced ever since uh, you know uh, psycho and uh well mark have you ever been bitten by a sumatran rat monkey you know i have it 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 sucks right it's okay yeah it's okay i got yeah. to eat the monkey afterwards well, anyway, uh, suffice to say that the, when the mom is bitten by a Sumatran rat monkey, um, it somehow unleashes this unholy, weird, gory, zombie, hellacious monster scenario, and uh, her poor son has to cope with the whole thing. Um, you know, it's, it's kind of, uh, and it, it's like out Romero's Romero is the whole point of this film. And it is now on Blu-ray from Lionsgate. And uh, I don't know if this movie needs to be on Blu-ray. It's uh, unless they want to just aggressively shove the detail of the gore in your face. To their credit, it is not so overmastered uh, and so loaded with uh, the noise removal concept that we have a problem with that you suddenly go, wow, that doesn't look like blood. That just looks like, uh, you know, caro syrup uh, mixed with, uh, you know, shortening and uh, color, artificial color. No, not at all. You, uh, it actually maintains the effect. So they did a good job of it. Again, I just don't know that uh, it actually has to be on Blu-ray, but I guess at this point everything has to be on Blu-ray. Well, no, or else they'd be remastering uh, more and more classics. Yeah, Instead, they're should. coming out with Fast and Furious or Fast Five or Fast, yeah, Fast Five. You know, um, people like Fast Five, I have to say. I know, it they shocks really me. I don't know why. The, the two series, the two film series that are as inexplicable to me for their longevity is uh, Harold and Kumar. Just don't get it. Now we got a 3D one coming out in, the, in a month or so. I, 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 don't, I don't understand why that maintains popularity. But, um, and then the Fast and the Furious and Fast Five and all whatever else they're calling these things. I just don't get it. I don't I, know. Look. It's the same over and over. On Rotten Tomatoes, Fast Five, top critics, not... Not all critics. Top critics on on uh, Fast Five seventy eight percent. Yeah, I know. It, it was a huge. I mean, they were shocked at how well it opened. And yeah, the problem is that the director Justin Lin. You know, this guy is being groomed to do like the next James Bond film or just something ridiculous. He's going to do. He's going to do another one of these. This is like his third one. He yeah. did. He did uh, the, the the Tokyo Drift film, and then right. he did the last one. He did this one. Well, this one I have to say that this one is not as, as horrible as. Is, it might be the best one, which again isn't saying a whole lot. I mean, obviously it's completely ridiculous, but it, it knows it's ridiculous. But uh, you know, the chase scenes are great, and it's you know they did a good job of uh, integrating all the CGI with the uh, with the live action stuff to make those chases a little bit more crazy. Um, you know, it's uh, it's it's you know, I have to say it's really 
it's really not bad. It's very high spirited and uh, it's completely ridiculous. All the chases are like the laws of physics are just suspended for this film. Yep. But if it knows it's doing that, then that's okay. It's if it's thinking it's trying to put one over on you, then it's not okay. I suppose. Uh, the film has uh, a bunch of featurettes, including one with uh, Tyrese, and there's an interview with uh, the director, uh, Justin Lin. And uh, it's got a Blu ray and a DVD also, and a digital copy. And, uh, you know, it looks beautiful, and the sound is great. I have to say, the sound is fantastic. Those right. cars will rev. If, if, if you have surround sound, put in f- rent Fast Five to show off your friends. Oh, yeah. And then uh, return it. And then, <laughs> and then return it. Although I, I think it's, uh, it, 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 it's, it's the best of a bad lot, put it that way. Got a couple of box sets to uh, talk about real quickly. Uh, this is from uh, the Lorber collection over at Kino Lorber. And uh, we talked about three of these when they were indi- released as individual Blu-rays a few weeks ago. And now uh, three of these films and a new one constitute a terrific Blu-ray collection, the Sophia Loren Award Collection. Five discs. And here's what you get. Uh, yesterday, to, uh, yesterday, Today, and Tomorrow, Marriage Italian Style, Sunflower, Boccaccio 70, and Vittorio D. Um, now, all of these films are directed by uh, Vittorio De Sica. Well, almost. Sunflower, Marriage, Italian Style, and Yesterday, Today, and Tomorrow are exclusively De Sica. Boccaccio 70 is kind of an omnibus thing that De Sica did along with uh, Fellini, Mario Monicelli, and Lucino Visconti. Imagine poor Monicelli being in that mix. Like... No one remembers Mario Monicelli, and you're making a movie along with Fellini, De Sica, and Visconti, like arguably the three greatest Italian filmmakers of all time. And you're Mario Monicelli. Okay, I'll help tag along. Uh, these uh, films are all from the 60s and then uh, Sunflower in 1970. And you know what? They're, they're not De Sica's best, and Boccaccio 70 isn't genius, but it's worth having. They, they represent a certain kind of Italian uh, glamour filmmaking from the period, uh, no matter how unglamorous some of these stories can be. And Sunflower is a little, you know, tries to get a little bit dirty, but uh, I'm sorry. When you've got, you know, music by Henry Mancini and then uh, Sophia Loren and Marcello Mastroianni, there's, that's, just, that's, that's a glorious movie. Fabulous. And, of course, uh, Mastroianni is, uh, is also in uh, the other two De Sica solos, Yesterday, Today, and Tomorrow, and uh, Marriage Italian Style. So you could argue that this is as much a uh, Sophia Loren and a Mar- um, uh, Marcello Mastroianni collection as anything else. Uh, so it's pretty great. I would uh, highly recommend this if you don't have the films individually. If you have them individually, no reason to get this. Speaking of things there's no reason to get, Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. Oh. This is, uh, As Tim- opposed to Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory. Correct. Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory, which is, uh, just had its, uh, it's having its big Blu-ray, I insane, think, yes. beautiful, awesome, gold-plated. We will be talking about that momentarily. Golden, not, not today, but next week. Golden ticket moment on you know, Blu-ray. There's this. You know, um, I am becoming less and less a fan of Tim Burton. I think that, uh, as we've mentioned before, he picks movies based on their, you know, production design possibilities more than the storytelling. But I, I, I will, I, I will admit this: as much as I love Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory, and I Jeez. love Gene Wilder, Jeez. the whole nine yards. Yes. Uh, for about for about forty five minutes in this film, I thought, oh my God, Burton's going to do it. He's going to make a good, worthy successor. He's going to do it. And then when Johnny Depp shows up, it all ended. Yeah. I just think that the Johnny Depp character, he's – I just think he's bizarre without – I, I, I can help you with this. Yes. Carol Channing. Huh? Carol Channing. Explain. Uh, after we saw this, our good friend Andy Klein – uh, walked out and he goes, why was Johnny Depp doing an impersonation of Carol Channing the whole time? <laughs> Which I, I was like, oh my gosh, you just completely in that one sentence summed up all of my reservations about the performance. I uh, know. He just, uh, Depp just, he just shanked it. Yeah. It's just bizarre. I just think that kids will freak out. They'll think he's odd. They won't know what to make of him. He's got no humor. He's just too peculiar. He's just charmless. It's just not a good performance from him. Yep. Uh, but of course the production design is great Blah 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 The songs by Danny Elfman are not as good as the songs in the original no. Because there's no charm to them There's no. no lightness to them No, You know it's just so dark God stop it Stop making movies Tim Burton uh, <laughs> Oh it looks good The DVD looks fine Just who cares I know Stop it uh, we gotta How be- many franchises much This is two he, he ruined Planet of the Apes Which just got rebooted obviously Much more successfully He ruined Planet of the Apes temporarily And he ruined uh, uh, Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory. Uh, 
And he's about to ruin Dark Shadows. I, uh, you know, I'm so scared of what's going to happen with that dark. That first photo from Dark Shadows came out, and I, I just thought, oh no, really, seriously, this is what you're going to make it look like? It's like he took Barnabas Collins and made him just unbelievably, unbearably twee. And I that, think that Barnabas Collins and Barnaby Jones should be combined to make Barnabas Jones an elderly, urban vampire detective. In my soul in my gut in the center of my being i knew you were going to make that joke i don't know why i just Yay. oh man okay the gamma trilogy is a uh, triple feature triple feature uh, gosh stumbling over my words today is a triple feature from mill creek on uh, on blu-ray and uh, if you're a gamma fan if you like uh, you know like godzilla with flying turtles uh, you're going to love this uh, this is uh, Guardian of the Universe, Attack of the Legion, and Revenge of Iris. Oh, Iris, why did you come back with so much revenge? Um, look, bottom line, Gamera, it's all the same. There's almost no point in actually detailing uh, what these films are about. These are recent films, I should point out, or relatively recent in the Gamera compendium, all from the 1990s, 95, 96, and 99. So these are not, you know... 19, vintage 1970 Gamera films. No, this is the uh, ongoing uh, Gamera thing. And um, this is actually a complete planned trilogy. This was uh, released as Gamera 1, 2, and 3 with those subheadings that I recently read. And um, you know what? It's fine. It, it, you know, it's not vintage fun, but it's, it's okay. It, uh, it, it sort of, I guess you could, I guess it belongs to the original Gamera saga. It, it feels enough like it that if you're a fan of the old films, you'll like these. Wade, uh, there is a new DVD out. Uh, they are double dipping on Soap Dish. Now, I, I have a feeling I know why they're double dipping on the uh, Soap Dish. Why do you think? Because it's been a rather uh, tumultuous time for soap operas. Uh, they are being canceled left and right. In fact, one of the major ones uh, just was canceled, and another major one is being canceled in a couple of months. And uh, soap operas are kind of dying, and yeah. they're being replaced by um, uh, ABC. Re ABC replaced, I think it was All My Children, with a talk show, this thing called The Chew, which is terrible and will be canceled soon. And these, I'll tell you, there is nothing, you know, there is nothing like a soap opera fan scorned. There is just no fury. Hell hath no fury like a soap opera fan scorned, because these people are crazy. I hear you. They are crazy. I so I think what they're trying to do is they're trying to uh, maybe kind of tap into the, you know, the, uh, the, Disaffected soap opera fan. Notice it's not on Blu-ray because the average soap opera fan probably does not own a Blu-ray. They probably own a DVD player. But it is the 20th anniversary of the film, and uh, you know it's a f it's a fun movie. It's um, I hit the mic, huh? I hit the mic. I did not know that because I'm not wearing a headphone because you won't buy me a new headset. <laughs> my headset. I haven't used my headset in like five months because you, you won't buy me a new you headset. Always, you always hated wearing it anyway. I know it messes up my hair. See. Uh, Sally Field, Kevin Klein, Robert Downey Jr., Whoopi Goldberg. Mm -hmm. It's a great cast. It's all about the, uh, the comings and goings of a uh, soap called The Sun Also Sets. And it's funny. And um, the DVD is uh, fine. Special features include nothing particularly interesting. Actually, only one, a behind-the-scenes featurette, which, I, which I, I saw, which is probably ported over from the original DVD. Um, does the movie look good? You know, whatever. Not really. It looks fine. It's just a function of whether you love the movie. And I do think it's a cute movie. I do. I think it's funny. Got a good cast, and it's uh, it's it's got that that you know that that TV satire thing that I always love. I'm going to roll through some uh, some relatively minor titles, but stuff that we think is worth mentioning. Uh, we got a couple of Warner Archive titles. Now you find these by going to WarnerArchive.com, not Warner Archives, but Warner Archive singular dot com. Uh, these are, of course, DVD-Rs. They are uh, made to order, M-O-D, uh, made uh, manufacture on demand, I believe is the proper term for these. Uh, one of these is a cult camp classic. I've got to tell you, this is a terrific film, Black Zoo. Now, if you've never seen Black Zoo, you are missing out. This thing is from the uh, early 1960s, and it's, it's, from, it's kind of a weird, I guess you could probably call it a horror film, uh, Basically, you got a guy who's uh, kind of a—he's got a weird little private zoo action going on with a lot of you know monkeys and lions and so forth, and uh, his wife uh, absconds with the monkeys or the chimps, and uh, boy, he 
he really doesn't like that. And then, you know, it's just a lot of uh, fur and fury and everything else is just hysterical. It's, it's campy. It's silly. Um, but you know what? It's, uh, it, it, it's fine. It's, uh, it's got all these little kind of vintage uh, winks and nods, and you'll enjoy it. It's silly, but you'll, you'll have fun. And then The Phantom of Hollywood, uh, starring Jack Cassidy, of all people. Everybody has forgotten about Jack Cassidy. Mark? Tell everybody who Jack Cassidy is. All right, never mind. I'll tell them. Uh, Jack Cassidy is, of course, the father of uh, everybody else named Cassidy. Um, everybody else? Well, Butch Cassidy? Of, uh, not Butch Cassidy. Uh, David Cassidy and, um, you know, Sean, Patrick, and Ryan Cassidy. You know, what people don't know about, uh, about uh, Jack Cassidy is that he was offered and turned down mm-hmm. the role of Ted Baxter on The Mary Tyler Moore Show. Really? Yes, that is true, which was, of course, a uh, part that went memorably, brilliantly, all-time classic-y to Ted wow. Knight. Wow. Well, Ted Knight. He, you know what? He would have been a good, a good one as well. I mean, everybody knows that, you know. No, Ted, Ted Knight rocked that thing like you. Uh, it, it, it was the greatest. Everybody Just the knows, greatest. Everybody knows David and Sean Cassidy, because David Cassidy, of course, part of his family. Sean Cassidy, uh, to do Run Run on the uh, Hardy Boys. Remember that? To do Run Run? He also played with uh, Linda Blair in a different, wasn't it, uh, it, well, they were like, you know, they both had Down syndrome and they had a romance. And What? Who are you? I don't know. Anyway. Brian's song? Uh, is it Brian's song? No, it wasn't, it wasn't Brian's song. <laughs> anyway, this is 1973. Uh, we, boy, we've gone far afield here. Um, Phantom of Hollywood with uh, Jack Cassidy, Broderick Crawford, Peter Lawford, and Jackie Coogan. And, uh, you know, it's, uh, the, the whole thing is, is kind of a... Uh, a throwback to the uh, Phantom of the Opera concept, but uh, it's, you know, it, it, it's done in a cheesy 70s kind of a way, and uh, it, it's worth a look if you're kind of a vintage 70s cheesy kind of a filmmaking buff. Low budget. So I'm checking Ted Knight's uh, Wikipedia page. You know, you know what his, na- his, his birth name? Huh. Uh, Tad Dudes? Waddleslaw Konopka. You're crazy. Um, His parents are crazy. He was in in Caddyshack. And then real quickly, a thing here called, we got to move on to some television. Want to get some television out of the way. Screen Media has released a little thing called Jig, um, which they're pouring an awful lot into. And I think uh, this has something to do with... um, Glee as well, you know the pop. Not that it has anything to directly to do with Glee, but the popularity of Glee, I think, is. Uh, this is uh, basically a documentary about the uh, for the fortieth Irish Dancing World Championships. Which, if you are a fan of Lord of the Dance, and Mark always makes fun of me for uh, actually having ever been someone who said a decent thing about Michael Flatley. Um, this is that's basically what this is. This is just all. The, this is where people go every year to do that. Uh, that. River dance thing, and uh, I think it's fun. I think it's awfully fun, and it's uh, you know it's a little bit like a, a real life strictly ballroom, uh, kind of crossed with the Lord of the Dance. It's uh, it's terrific and uh, eccentric and cool and provincial, and uh, it's out on Blu-ray and DVD combo, and uh, it looks lovely. So go knock yourselves out. <laughs> now while Wade queues up the uh, the audio questions, the audio comments from Lance Taylor. We'll talk about uh, Pee-wee's Big Adventure. This is finally on Blu-ray. This is uh, Tim Burton, folks. This is Tim Burton. Early Tim Burton. Very early. As early as it gets, feature film-wise. This is, of course, an extension of uh, P- uh, um, Paul Rubens' Pee-wee Herman character, which was on uh, television and then extended to uh, film. You know, originally, legend has it. And Broadway. And Broadway. And we even have, we're going to be talking about that uh, in, in the coming shows. We are. Uh, rumor has it that uh, Paul Rubens' favorite film was uh, Pollyanna and that he was going to write a script based on Pollyanna where he would become Crazy. Pollyanna. And then uh, this is the apocryphal story, although maybe it's true, I don't know, is that he was on the Warner Brothers lot uh, writing the film and he noticed that everybody at Warner Brothers, all the messengers and whatnot, they would get around the lot on bicycle. And when he saw everybody getting around the lot on a bicycle, that, that sparked his imagination and he wrote a movie about a boy and his bicycle. Uh, it's a good film. So it wasn't like De Sica that gave him the idea. It, it was not. Okay. Um, this is a good-looking uh, Blu-ray, high-definition transfer, 1080p. Uh, colors look good. Uh, definitely better than the uh, DVD version. Good skin tones. Uh, noise reduction. Couldn't really tell. Look pretty minor. The sound is the sound. 
You know, there's no. This doesn't scream for an upgrade, but if, if you if you just can't get your fill of large marge, why not? Well, the thing is that also, they never uh, they just ported over all the extras from the previous DVD. They didn't do any original extras no, for the no. Blu-ray. This is a spit it out in time for the holidays. It kind of get is. Get a jump. It get a jump is. on it. I agree. But you know what? It's a good movie. It's cute. Yeah. Even totally. though we were just ripping Tim Burton a new one about 10 minutes ago, it's still cute. All right, Mark. Here we go. Lance Taylor question number one. Hey, Wade and Mark. It's Lance. So I'm in the car, driving, thinking about movies. Because, I mean, really, paying attention to the road is overrated, isn't it? So I'm thinking about Tom Hanks. Larry Crown was a failure. Where do you see Tom Hanks' career going from this point? Also, has Tom Hanks ever played a villain? I mean, I'm going through the list of movies that I've seen him in, and I I don't recall him uh, playing a villain. What say you? Keep up the good work, and uh, be talking to you. Bye. Outstanding question. Uh, to the second part, no, I, I don't think Tom Hanks has ever played a bad guy. And frankly, I don't see that ever happening. He's just not that kind of guy. Well, here's the thing. It, it depends. Like, I, I, I think that Tom Hanks played a bit of a bad guy in, I don't know, Road to Perdition. Well, not Road to Perdition, but uh, yeah, like the Lady he, Killers, maybe he might have been not yeah, the nicest he's, guy, I he's, guess. But he's, rede- he's still redeemable. Right. In those, You still root for him. You still kind of empathize with him. I, I just don't know whether he's ever going to have that Henry Fonda, no. Once Upon a Time in America, oh my God, I can't believe yeah. Henry Fonda is the Once Upon a Time vicious, in the West. Uh, Once Upon a Time in the West. Yeah. I can't believe Henry Fonda is the most vicious bad guy in the world, yeah. sort of role reversal casting from Absolutely. heaven. Absolutely. I don't see Tom Hanks necessarily no, doing that. No, I, it's just not who he is. And if you've ever been to an event where you, you know, he's spoken, or if you've ever met him, it's just he, there, there's no there are no dark edges to his soul. I'm not sure that he could go to that place. Uh, as to where his career is going to go, honestly, I, I, you know, he he has a part, a, a very important part in uh, what is it, uh, Big and Loud and Far Away? What, what's that thing called? Oh, uh, uh, extremely loud and incredibly close. Yeah, that one. Uh, the time I can never remember, which is looking like it could be a very big Oscar contender this year. So, I mean, if that really kind of uh, comes through, Tom Hanks could be in the mix again. Larry Crown was, was a bomb. He's trying to be a young Tom Hanks with a young Julia Roberts, and they're both at an age where they shouldn't be doing that movie anymore. Uh, he also made the mistake of writing it with uh, uh, Nia Vardalos, Nia which is yeah. a... Just don't let that woman anywhere near your movie. She's a kiss of death now. But, uh, you know, they're family friends and, and all that stuff. Um Tom's going to not be that giant star that he used to be. That's that's not who he is now. And uh, he's past that that point. But I think as a filmmaker, as a producer, as an actor, he is still a force to be reckoned with. He's still a great actor. He still has really interesting taste. And he can still get things done. And remember, he played a big part in getting, uh, you know, the Pacific on the air and uh, a Band of Brothers. I mean, he can... You know, uh, the, 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 from the earth to the moon. I mean, he can get it done. So he is still a force to be reckoned with. Uh, so I don't think we'll see him as much as a movie star going forward, but I think we'll see him as certainly a tastemaker and a, and a producer of product, too. I agree. I agree. I, I, you know, really, if he is the Jimmy Stewart of this generation, I just don't see Hanks doing anything overtly horrible. I mean, I think there might be room yeah. to play a little bit like with the Lady Killers. There might be mm-hmm. room to play with his persona. But playing with your persona and tweaking it is not the same as saying, I'm going to play a supervillain in some big science fiction movie or I'm going to play a, uh, an unrepentant murderer. Yes. I just don't think he wants to do that. It's a little like Will Smith. You know, Will Smith's kind of the same way. Where, True. Where I don't know that Will Smith ever wants – you know, Will Smith turned down uh, you know, Django Unchained. Yeah. You know, I just don't think he ever wants to do anything that's going to make him less – the lovable Will Smith that we all love because he's so lovable. And these people have huge armies of handlers, let's remember, who uh, really weigh in very strongly on what this could mean for your future and your next choice, and etc., and what's coming down the line. And these people are thinking about offering you this, and these people have been asking about this, and is your availability this? I mean, you know, you're, these people are looking four or five, six years down the line at a lot of projects that are in development, maybe offering them money. I mean, there are a lot of considerations, so you don't want to sabotage that. That's true, Aid. Thank you, Lance. Yes, thanks, Lance. And here's Lance's other question. Hey, Wade and Mark. It's Lance again. So I have a question for you both. Um, In the early 90s, a movie called Johnny Suede, starring Brad Pitt, was released. Have you heard of it? Did you see it? And more importantly, did you enjoy it? A friend of mine... 
and I used to watch this movie on a loop in the early 90s, and we, we enjoyed the hell out of it. And uh, I see it's available on Netflix streaming now. It's totally quirky, offbeat, weird, and, uh, and funny. Actually, hilarious at times. That's my take on it. What's yours? Johnny Swade. You know, Johnny Swade is an interesting film. It, um, uh, that's the film that, that uh, put director Tom DiCillo and Brad Pitt so deeply on the outs that um, Tom DiCillo turned around and made Living in Oblivion basically as a way of ripping on, Tom, on, uh, on Brad Pitt. The experience was miserable for him, apparently. I actually met Tom DiCillo uh, on a more recent film of his that my wife was involved with uh, in New York. And a uh, lovely guy. Obviously, I'm not going to ask him about Brad Pitt, but it's, that's, that is at least what everyone understands. I think the film itself, I don't think if they had a bad working relationship, I don't think that film betrays it. I think Johnny Swade is a cool, slick little film. It's it an is. early Brad Pitt film. It's but, an early Brad Pitt film. Yeah. He looks so young then. He still has, even then, this is like, we're talking, what, a 91, something like that? Yeah. He still has his baby fat. I mean, he's really, this is, we're talking 20 years ago, which is just absolutely bizarre. But you know what? It's, it's, very, it's very hip. It's very postmodern. Uh, the, 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 the tone is just fun and consistent. And, uh, you, know, you know, look, DiCillo was a cameraman, so he, he, he knows what he wants to see. So I think it's got that stylish look. And, uh, you know, it's very offbeat. I liked it. I mean, I thought it was fine. I haven't seen it in years, but that's what I remember of it. I thought it was totally fine. So yeah, I would absolutely. say that is a definite streaming suggestion. Good one. Johnny Swade. Thanks to Lance Taylor. Thank you, Lance. And anybody else wants to send us in their audio questions or even their uh, email questions or just comments or hate mail, whatever. We take it all at gods at digigods.com. Uh, we're going to wrap out with a little bit of television now. Got some vintage television that is uh, out again, stuff that has been previously out, but it is now out uh, a second time in different packaging and uh, actually better transfers, I think. Uh, Eagle Media has released uh, the first two seasons of The Monkees. Finally. Yay. Now, this has been out before. Or the only two seasons of The Monkees, actually. Uh, it's been out before, and uh, in kind of cool little... You know, the original release of this was a cool little kind of record player packaging thing. So if you don't have that, too bad. It's out of print. But it looks maybe even a, a smidge better in this release, which is uh, a, a collaborative between Eagle Media and Rhino, actually. And, um, it, you know, good stuff. Uh, the pilot is absolutely terrific. Uh, looks surprisingly good for having been uh, extracted from 16 millimeter, And uh, you get little uh, select commentaries on here from uh, some of the originals, including, you know, Mickey Dolan's. And it's really fun. Fun stuff. So uh, I love the monkeys. Yeah. I do. I love the monkeys. Bob Rafelson. And then uh, also the Honeymooners lost episodes that were uh, released previously from uh, MPI between, uh, it was, these were you know made between 1951 and 57, not necessarily released as part of the original Honeymooners releases on DVD. These are now out in a new uh, boxed set, 50 hours worth, and they are hysterical and wonderful and classic and lots and lots of great stuff on this deluxe set, uh, home movie footage. Um, all kinds of uh, uh, you know additional uh, episode deuce. Oh, we're running out of time. I'm losing. I'm completely losing my train of thought. You know, uh, I have a, a, a distant relative who uh, was a director on. Oh, Hollywood. really? Yes. Awesome. Frank Satinstein was uh, related to my paternal grandmother. All right, Mark. Uh, a few more little uh, TV bits. Uh, 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 what, what else we got here? Grounded for Life, a show that okay. I don't like because uh, this guy, uh, uh, Donnell Logue, whatever his name is, he had a moment and it didn't really Ooh. develop into much. I saw him in Brentwood the other day. Did you? Yeah. I wouldn't even know what he looked like, yeah, I guess. <laughs> uh, not a great show. It's about a Staten Island couple, and uh, they got married very young, and now they're you know barely in their 30s, and you know they're trying to make it happen with their kids. Uh, this is the complete first season. Uh, it only lasted for a couple seasons, but uh, you know, if you like the show, there it is. I don't like the show. Okay. Uh, and some from ABC uh, that I'm going to roll through real quickly here to try and get this in before the uh, clock strikes 12. Body of Proof, the first season, Dana Delaney basically playing a, um, a, you know, a medical examiner, coroner. It's like Quincy, except she's way hotter. I so like her better than Quincy. Uh, there, we get medical examiner shows every so often, uh, and this one's fine. It, it could be better written, but Dana Delaney is one of my all-time faves, so i gotta, I got to support the show. She's, uh, she rocks. She's great. And then we also have the uh, complete fourth season of Private Practice and the complete seventh season of Grey's Anatomy, the show that spawned it. I, um, I was a huge Grey's Anatomy fan for a long time, and then just they moved it, and I kind of lost touch with the show. And when I came back to it, and especially watching the seventh season, it's lost something. It's just 
Something's not the same. It's uh, It feels a little tired. They need to inject something new into it. But you know what? Private practice, I expected very little of. And uh, it ain't bad. Um, so this is this has turned out to be an actually uh, a pretty great uh, spinoff. And uh, I, I wish it well going forward. Um, let's see. Mark, what else do we have here? Uh, uh, dude, you're, you, you're got, in your own world. I don't know where you're going. I don't either. I'm just trying to. I'm just trying to. Well, you know what? Uh, yeah, whatever, dude. Just let, go nuts. Okay, uh, uh, Camelot, uh, Star's original series, the first season on Blu-ray. Um, it's the silliest Camelot you will ever see, but uh, it's well done. So juvenile and not terribly well written, but production value is off the charts, and the Blu-ray looks sensational. All right, um, Mark. <laughs> yes. We uh, we just completed a DVD commentary as well for which we should plug for a forthcoming Vanguard DVD release of uh, Jester Till. Yes. We had fun doing it, didn't we? We did. Jester we Till's did. a terrific little animated awesome. film from Germany. Yes, indeed. And but we were in English. Very, huh? But in English. But in English. All right, that's it. Under the gun. See you next week.